Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Hey, and thanks for listening in to the Future Christian Podcast. My name is Lauren Richmond Jr., and I am pleased today to be joined by today, Bethany Dearborn Heiser. So hello. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me. So Bethany is the director of Soul Care for Northwest Family Life, a network of therapists trained to work with survivors of domestic violence and sexual trauma. As a bilingual social worker, chaplain, and pastoral advocate, she has worked in a variety of ministry and social service settings with people affected by addiction, sexual exploitation, incarceration, and immigration. Bethany and her husband, Kenny, live in Seattle. Oh, there you go. I could have just read the back of your book. I was asking her earlier where she lived uh, with her two young children. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What else would you like our listeners to, to know about yourself? Yeah, I mean, I guess, um, to be honest, doing new podcasts is new territory for me, as the bio you just read said i've been mainly more dr- working directly with people mm-hmm. um in the on the front lines and to be honest i never would have thought i would have ri- written a book um about trauma informed soul care that's part of my own journey and story is mm-hmm. someone who didn't think that self care was for me or needed or yeah. important and but i was good i i was doing fine you know i was just handling it and um and yeah i was working a, a lot and um I was working a couple different jobs and doing my master's in social work and um, yeah, I wasn't aware of kind of the toll that the work was having on me and then experienced my own burnout. Um, so I've had to learn through the hard way, which is often how we learn, right? Yeah. 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 Well, tell our listeners, uh, if you would, kind of about your journey of faith, um, how you got, how you came to faith and then what your, what your faith looks like now. Yeah, I, mean, I grew up in the church. Uh, my dad is, is a pastor, not of a kind of local church, but just was um, worked in a seminary later when I was growing up. And mm-hmm. um, my mom is also a the theologian. Oh, they're really? Both, wow. Yeah, I have two theologian parents. So grew up with, you know, good dinner conversations. And, yeah. And I still, I mean, my have a lot of similarity in what I believe with what my parents believe. And so there wasn't Mm -hmm. a lot of people have kind of a pushback of separation from their growing up faith. And I um, am very grateful for the faith journey that um, my parents have been on and the way that they um, raised us as kids to be connected and to God and to think critically and to ask good questions. Um, and that God is a God of love. And so that was, that was, and that God is triune, that there's creator and spirit, Holy Spirit and Jesus, and that we are invited into part- into relationship with God, as well as to love those around us. And so I felt like I, I gleaned that and I received that from my, my childhood and through mm-hmm. my young adulthood. Um, and then I started praying that God would break my heart <laughs> with the things that break God's heart. Mm. Um, and that, you know, I've heard that can be a dangerous yeah. prayer because <laughs> uh, that's what started happening. And, you know, I grew up, grew up in a lot of privilege as a white, educated um, American. And I, with my eyes started being open in high school um, through a number of different mission trips, to be honest, mm-hmm. as well as then yeah. also um, in college and studying all sorts of social realities, poverty and injustice and racism. Um, and also in relationship, I started mentoring girls going into juvie. And as is a lot of the case when we do volunteer work is that we end up being mentored yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. and changed. And so my eyes were opened in a new ways there. Um, and I, so I became, I graduated college. Just, I remember taking this class called ethics um, and of religion and we finished talking about the ethics of doing good and mm-hmm. what does that mean and i remember thinking i'm so sick of tired and tired of talking about doing good i just want to go out there and do it yeah so i i just graduated ready to go like let's let's just go do stuff and so um i 
knew that God invited us to be, you know, the, the hands and feet of God. That's kind of where I was at. Yeah. Um, and thought, okay, I got to go do stuff. And, and yet the participation that God is, um, at work in us and through us, and yet does not depend on us, that, that lesson had to come later, mm. <laughs> um, for me. And so I, and, and also that my well being is important to God, you know, in my head, I got yeah. that. Um, yeah, sure. That we are loved, right. That, that God matters, that we are, we matter to God. But, you know, I think I, in my heart or the way that I lived was that I matter to God, um, for what I do. And yeah. so I need to keep doing and I need to do it well. And I need to love people. Well, that's the way I'm going to change things in this world is by doing things. Um, and yet to, so that just kind of kickstarted me on this whole journey is <laughs> it's all up to me to do stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll, we'll dive into these themes a little bit here in a bit when we go into your book, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm intrigued by just that analogy you make about the, what I hear is the head and the heart disconnect. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it reminds me of so much what I heard, um, growing up about having a faith it was kind of a detrimental thing to have a faith that was in your head and not in your heart. Um, and it's, it's almost like a reverse of that where like we believe it. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's kind of like what you're saying, I think just resonates with me about knowing these things in, in my head, if God loves mm -hmm. me and I'm a child of God and all that, but having it that disconnect from your heart. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's save that for later. because mm. It's already hitting me. Um, mm. Talk about uh, a spiritual practice that's been meaningful or helpful for you that you might recommend others. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I think I've needed to slow down and to create space to receive from God. And part of that has been that shift for me of that I'm valued, that God loves me, not for just what I do. And um, so practices such as centering prayer, where you're literally not doing anything. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're familiar with centering prayer, but it's yeah. created by Father Thomas Keating and uh, the idea of sitting for, they recommend 20 minutes. Um, I usually have five or 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but even that is a gift for me that when I stop and I be still and know that God is God, right? That's mm -hmm. our, that's often, that's our invitation that we talk about, but do we practice it? Do we, do we live into that and say, okay, I'm just going to be present to you, God. And you don't, I don't need to do anything right now. There's no agenda for this time together, but I get to just let go of what I'm holding on to and receive what you have for me right now in stillness and in silence. Uh, so that's been a very grounding practice for me mm -hmm. as well as Lexio Divina and other, and the exam and other contemplative practices where I invite God to be with me and to have per God's perspective on my day and what I've been experiencing and to, to, um, kind of do invite God to help me do that inner work of reflection and connection to God and to receive God's love. So those are kind of some of the, the I would say, and journaling too. I feel like as someone who processes through writing, mm -hmm. um, journaling has been very helpful for me. I have to ask, was it hard for you to, uh, I think anyone who's like a caregiver or in that broadly speaking kind of caregiving mm -hmm. profession, stopping, pausing is hard. Uh, I, I don't know. If it, I'm curious for you if it was similar for me, like when I've, when I've tried, um, contemplative prayer just feels like torture to have to sit still for five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, it's, I think that's, that's an invitation there to press into it, right? Yeah, it's that yeah. it doesn't feel good. And we're so used to busyness and to noise in our culture and to accomplishing things. And that just flies in the face of it is, and it's even the posture of pausing it's the same with Sabbath rest is that mm -hmm. the, the, honoring of the sabbath is saying that it's not all up to me um the rhythm of five minutes <laughs> in the middle of my day or the at the end of the day is saying i'm gonna it's what i do is not the be all end all mm -hmm. um that we are invited to connect with god and i need god <laughs> mm -hmm. i i if i want to love other people um if i want to be a transforming agent in this world um i 
I need to be present to the source of life. Mm. Um, and, you know, I talk about my, in my book, the, the image of the vine and, you know, Jesus isn't saying, um, giving that, that example, uh, in a judgmental way that we need to be connected to the vine, but it's just truth. If, if that branch is not connected to the vine, it, it withers and yeah. it, we need our source. And so I think, um, whatever practices that help us connect with the source of life, um, with God, uh, yes, it can be challenging because, because we're so not used to it and because, um, we like to feel successful and that we're doing. And yet I would say we need it all the more. It's not like we haven't all said it enough lately. These are unprecedented times. COVID-19 has upended the way we do life, community, and church. As church leaders, we find ourselves disoriented. Outreach, connection, cultivating a sense of team among church staff and creatives, nothing works like it did before. Torn Curtain Arts gets it and we're here to help. We strengthen the creative soul of churches. It's why we exist. And in these times, we have dedicated ourselves to helping churches set up live streaming solutions and assisting with live events. We also provide coaching for worship leaders, as well as substitute worship leading for both in-person and online events. Contact us at torncurtainarts.org and let's chat about how we can keep you connected to your creativity in this season and grow your community. Well, let's talk about your book. Um, Bethany is the author of From Burned Out to Beloved, Soul Care for Wounded Healers. Now, uh, I was I was immediately uh, intrigued by, I was telling you before we started recording about the title of this, just because uh, as we're recording this, it's the end of, I mean, a few days away from the end of 2020. Uh, as a pastor, I know so many pastors, and I keep hearing this again and again and again, who are just kind of like, exhausted and thinking about quitting ministry um so i the the title immediately resonated resonated with me and interestingly enough uh, you mentioned you wrote this pre-covid uh believe it or not and it's still very relevant but talk about kind of uh the why of the book I, I i know when i was reading it, i was really struck by your authenticity and vulnerability in the book um but tell us a little bit more about that yeah thank you I, so I was, um, pretty tired and skeptical of traditional self-care, mm -hmm. uh, frameworks. And, um, you know, part of my journey is that I, yeah, I did a master's in social work and a friend had invited me to take a self-care for social workers class. And I thought, oh, it's just going to do that same, you know, eat well, sleep, exercise. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, I'm good. I'm done. Yeah. And I don't know if you've done those kind of pie chart, uh, you know, your emotional, psychological, um, spiritual, physical, emotional well-being, you know, into different categories. And you kind of evaluate where you are at with those. Mm -hmm. So I'd gone to a couple of different workshops where we'd done that. And I usually just felt left feeling more guilty <laughs> and like I was failing and I should be yeah. doing more that I'm not doing well. Yeah. And that didn't equip me for change. It just made me feel like, well, this is, I'm more stressed out now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so... Um, that the class, it was very different from that. It was taught by Laura Vandernut Lipsky, who's the author of Trauma Stewardship. And it really helped connect dot, dots for me about secondary trauma and the stories that I was hearing of people who are suffering and experiencing a lot of violence and separation and, and poverty and the way, um, though that those realities were impacting me mm -hmm. and, it normalized what I was experiencing and it gave me words to describe, Oh, I feel guilty for taking care of myself. Yeah. Um, and then another, and also helped me say, that, you know, um, I need to, I'm not okay. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of the first step of recovery. And so, um, and yeah, I still needed something that was rooted, um, the integrated spiritual practices. Like I was kind of left wanting from mm -hmm. that resource and, I wanted something that integrated inner healing and kind of the recovery work that I was also being exposed to in my own work that with people in recovery, that we need to dig into some of the beliefs that impact our behavior. Yeah. Otherwise I can say, I'm going to do that spiritual practice every day. And yep. unless I do my inner work, you know, I'm just going to feel like I'm failing again. <laughs> um, and so just to, to start to unpack some of those inner beliefs that we have about ourselves that 
you know, whatever, if it's worthlessness or whatever it is. And, um, and then move towards changing behavior. Um, as, well, so I think, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, let's, I was going to say this question for later, but let's talk more about that. Um, how our beliefs influence our behaviors. Cause you had, there's two things you wrote about that stood out to me. One was you talked about original sin and then you, you wrote about how Jesus began his public ministry. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a message for this for the first of the year uh, on the, on the baptism of Jesus when God calls him beloved. Uh, talk mm-hmm. about that. How, cause I don't, I don't think most of us think about And I think you nailed it. Like when you're, when you're talking about how we can do these practices, but if it's not impacting our, the core things we believe about ourselves, it's still going to be lacking or mm-hmm. we're still going to struggle, I guess. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot there, right? I mean, the, you yeah. know, Jesus, God called the, the father calls Jesus beloved before mm-hmm. we know that he's done anything to help people, Yeah, you know, and that's, that's Jesus. Right. <laughs> um, and so it's the same for us that God calls us beloved regardless of what we do or don't do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that reframing, and you mentioned the original sin and that I, um, I've always had a hard time with kind of the, we are depraved, we are evil. Yeah. Um, cause it doesn't, that doesn't seem like how God, um, is wooing us throughout scripture and in my sure, life and sure. that God is a God of love, that God is, is desperate to be connected to us and to know us and to be in relationship. And, um, and so I, when I, I read, um, Daniel or Danielle Schreier has a book mm-hmm. about original blessing and she really helped kind of me articulate kind of what I had been seeing. And, um, and what I had been starting to believe is that, you know, we really, we need to have a theology of original blessing um, that the that we are good and beloved before we are anything else. Um, that sin is not at the heart of our nature, but blessing is. And so um, that theology of an original sin, I think it really has impacted how we see ourselves yeah. and how we operate in the world, that it says that we are fundamentally wrong. Yeah. Um, and we have but the shift is that although we have capacity, we all have capacity for doing evil. We are wounded. We are broken. Mm-hmm. Um, but we are not evil. We are in need of healing. We are broken. Yeah. Um, and, but that doesn't declare our worth. You know, there's a difference there mm-hmm. that um, God can, can still say we are valuable and we are worth it and we are broken. And so that, that's the whole wounded healers is that um, we all have wounds and we need to acknowledge our wounds and not deny them. Yeah, that's a beautiful. Talk a little bit about secondary trauma for those who are not familiar with that idea and concept. Yeah, sometimes it's called vicarious trauma. Um, so it's the trauma that we experience through hearing about something that was traumatic. Mm-hmm. Um, so primary trauma would be receipt experiencing trauma. Yeah. Um, and secondary would be, you know, when I heard stories of women who've been um, sexually and, and abused or that, that didn't happen to my person, but I, sure. it was traumatic to hear about it. Yeah. Um, and they, it, secondary trauma can have very similar uh, PTSD, like hmm. post-traumatic stress wow. disorder, like effects on us where there's sleeplessness, where you have nightmares, where um, there are hi- hypervigilance, where you can't slow down, you can't stop. Mm-hmm. Um as well as diminished creativity, like inability to um, think critically, and you just kind of go into this black and white, either or. Um, I mean, we're a traumatized uh, nation (laughs) in some ways, right? Yeah. And so it's much, and people, and it's much easier to go into that black and white, either or thinking, um, putting things in binary instead to, and that's, that can be a trauma exposure response. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, as well as the guilt, that's one, the feeling like you can never do enough, that hopelessness, um, there's always more to do, it's all up to me, as well as um, ex- at utter exhaustion yeah. and uh, isolation. These are these are things that, you know, thinking that I'm tough enough, I can handle it. Those yeah. are, um, the denial of self <laughs> can, can be part of it too. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned this already, uh, but one of the reasons for our listeners why I wanted to have Bethany on was just because I was really thinking about my own experience in 2020 as a pastor, thinking about the experiences of so many pastors I know, and then hearing stories of other church leaders. And like, 
so much of what you just said there, I think really resonates with uh, what I've experienced and what I know other pastors have experienced. Um, and I think talk about this. I, I know you've, you you wrote about kind of having difficulty separating your identity. Um, what from who you are versus what you did. I know that's, uh, and I'm kind of being narrow here talking about pastors, but I know this is often something, uh, you know, I'll admit, <laughs> even I struggle with, I think, uh, and I know other pastors struggle with this, this, this tendency to equate who I am with what I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's, we all have normal human needs. Yeah. <laughs> we have a need for impact. We have a need for intimacy. We have a need for affirmation. Um, for control, for security, you know, these are, that's been really helpful for me is to recognize those normal needs that we have and um, nonviolent communication. I don't know if you're familiar with that yeah, in the work. Yeah. yeah. So he, Marshall Rosenberger has it, you know, 40, 40 long list of our normal needs. And mm-hmm. so um, as well as other, obviously there's Maslow's hierarchy and there's different ways yeah. that people have categorized these. And so I think, just to recognize whatever profession, whatever, you know, just living life, we have needs that we try to meet um, and we can meet those in healthy and not so healthy ways. And so yeah. as a, I'm not a pastor, but for, for yourself and for others, you have a need for impact. That's okay. That's good. You know, mm, and yeah. you have a need for affirmation. That's okay. <laughs> That's good. That's yeah. how God created us. Yeah. And yet if we are driven by that and if we're not aware of how that need is, is, we're motivated by those needs. Um, and if we're not receiving care in that way, um, outside of our work, then we can do so. We can seek after those things in unhealthy ways. So we can yeah. seek after affirmation from the people we're yeah. working with and it drives our responses instead of being led by God or being, and being rooted that I am already loved. I'm affirmed. I'm a beloved daughter of God. You are a beloved son of God. And if people disagree with what you say, that's okay. You know, it's, but it's also okay to say that it, it doesn't feel good. Right. <laughs> um, and that you have a need for affirmation. Yeah. You know, just so the complexity again, we, we, we like the black and white and, or the binary thinking. Mm-hmm. And so um, the complexity of saying that I have that need and yet I need to receive from God and I need to have community of people who are loving me and caring for me. Um, so that I can stay grounded in my identity and love those who I'm walking with in a healthy way. There's one Does pastor. That make sense? Yeah, there's one pastor I follow uh, who's talked about how like unhealthy behaviors for him can often be looked upon favorably in pastoral ministry because it's like I don't know if it was him, but it, he talked about like pastors. I don't know if you've seen data on this. It's shockingly scary. Uh, pastors have a tendency towards narcissism. It's kind of off the charts scary how much it is. So uh, he, he was using, I think, this example of how like like things that can be narcissistic or other and healthy behaviors can be perceived in, as a pastor or a church leader as being like, hey, a, as a dedicated worker type thing. Um, and, I, you know, you worked in a different context but I got to imagine, like, for you, it's similar. Like, people see you, like, going out of your way. Like, you talk you talk about, like, what, going after your second job to go help a family or something like that in the book. And mm-hmm. from the outside, it looks like, oh, Bethany is just a dedicated worker. Mm-hmm. And it kind of just, I don't know, for you, it kind of, like, if it reinforces this narrative, like, hey, I'm doing good, even though this is yeah. really bad for me. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, we... Um... It feels good to help people. We have a need. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, as a Enneagram too, I'm a helper personality. That yeah. I, I'm, I have a need to be needed. And so mm-hmm. um, however humbling that is. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I, I, and I passionately care for people who are suffering. And so, yeah. um, again, holding those both in tension with each other. And so, yeah, I push myself. I, you know, I go from, I, respond i'd be working at the domestic violence shelter and then during my lunch break someone i knew from my the ministry job that i was working at would call me saying they were run broke you know their car had broken down and so i would run to the, help <laughs> them and then go back to my my the domestic violence shelter and um yeah and i just kept going and going and yeah it's not to say that that was a bad act in and of itself you know mm-hmm. to do that 
And yet, um, like you mentioned, we can kind of give each other accolades for how busy we are and yeah. how helpful we are in certain ways. And is that feeding our soul? Yeah. <laughs> is that is that what's nourishing us? Or can we be fed from another source? You know, that's... Um, are we gaining our sense of affirmation from what we do in that way and thinking, oh, I really have worth and value because I help a lot of people. Um, or I go into the jail and um, do chaplaincy in the jail. And, mm -hmm. you know, that sounds all radical and whatever. And um, and so does that is that helping me feel like I, I have a place in this world because I feel um, I'm important in a certain way or something. And um, and you know, and the reality is, is that I received so much when I would go into the jail that the woman helped me believe in God. Hmm. Um, and so again, just to, to recognize that we are, um, the mutual transformation that happens when we are willing to receive gifts that other people are offering us and not coming, um, as the savior in our savior complex kind of. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talk about when I read this in the book, it kind of like struck me. Talk about, uh, or I guess, correct me if I'm wrong here, but as I read it in the book, you seem to say overwork. You talk about overwork as an addiction. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. So, hey, uh, I'll say that kind of struck me. And I'll say as someone who, like, loves to-do lists and staying busy, we talked about that in our emails, uh, setting this up. What do you, uh, what do you say to I don't know what what do you say to me someone like me or someone like us who just loves to be busy um and to get them and especially I think I'm challenged by that overworking as an addic addiction uh mm -hmm. talk through that some more I guess Yeah I mean I think I would ask what is it doing for you mm -hmm. um what what is it feeding <laughs> in you Yeah um why are you overworking you know why um, and I think even the, the pausing and reflecting, mm -hmm. um, we don't like to give space to that. Yeah. Um, we don't like to, to reflect because for me, I was a f kind of, didn't know what would come up and it, it takes a certain kind of energy to slow down and to reflect and to yeah. think critically. Um, and we might not even be aware that we're running from it. Um, yeah. by being busy. Yeah. And that's where the addiction piece yeah. is present. Um, you know, people who use substances are using them to feel normal or to shove emotions. Yeah. And it's the same overwork, codependency. Um, they're, we're using them to feel better about ourselves. So good. Um, yeah. And so it's, and these are societally endorsed addictions. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and so they're, that's why this maybe it came as a surprise is that we don't often talk about them. We give, mm -hmm. we give ourselves, um, each other praise for them. And so to, to pause and say, what is this doing for me? What am I getting from this? Cause it's doing something for right. us, right? It's yeah. the, that's any addiction. It's, it, it benefits us in a certain way. And so that's part of the Genesis process is a relapse prevention program mm -hmm. that we use with people in recovery. And it's, it's been super helpful for me, um, to kind of unpack my own codependency and, I would highly recommend it. They actually have change groups that are geared for people in churches to do their inner work. And oh, um, it's not just for substance abuse. It's for all sorts of societally endorsed addictions, but it's, it, it's tools and it's resources and mm -hmm. it's kind of looking at our limbic brain. You know, it's actually integrates neurochemical research as well as inner healing. And it's, it's rooted in, um, in Jesus. And so I, it's an excellent resource to kind of walk with people and and challenge church groups, you know, mm -hmm. people in churches to have those difficult conversations. You know, often um, people have said like, Hey, it feels kind of fake <laughs> in a, you know, we just talk at surface level in a church yeah, and, yeah. Um, and everyone looks like every, they're doing fine and there's no problems. Yeah. And, and so how do we, as, as followers of Jesus, who Jesus welcomes the broken, welcomes us in our woundedness. How do we, invite each other and invite ourselves to be okay with our wounds <laughs> hmm. and to acknowledge them and to say, um, Hey, we're not, we don't have to have it all together. Um, actually Jesus says, Hey, I, I came for the sick. Yeah. <laughs> I came for the unwell. Yeah. Um, yeah. so those who are thirsty, those who are hungry, come 
come, you know, this is, this is a safe place for you. And so I think even you were mentioning pastors, the overwork, like what if there was a different way? What if pastors led, um, not through busyness, but through saying, Hey, you know, I, I can't right now because I won't be fully present to you, but I yeah. could tomorrow or, you know, today I'm, um, and not, it, yeah. And to, to honor times off. And sometimes that can be taken to the extreme where people, yep. um, that in itself becomes a protective measure in an unhealthy way. Uh, <laughs> sure, and that can sure. be a sign of burnout too, actually. Interesting. It's, you just go to the black and white of no. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that's a trauma exposure response is saying yes all the time or saying no all the time. So just by saying no doesn't mean you're healthy. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, the importance of boundaries. Um, we could have a whole other conversation about that. But uh, I'm, I'm kind of laughing as you were talking because... <laughs> Whenever I would see, I know in the past, whenever I see like fellow pastors or leaders talking about, oh, I'm taking a day off to go hiking. I'm just like, must be nice having nothing to do. <laughs> kind of like, hey, yeah. I have I have things to do. I have more important things to do than take time away. Yeah, uh, and that's that's our that's our normal conversation with each other. And instead, yeah, what it what would it be like to say, like, good for you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, and to encourage each other towards that and to towards life. And you know, Jesus said life to the fullest. What does yeah. it look like to, um, and what is that, you know, it, for you, is there a voice saying like, Oh, I'm, I, I need to be doing what I'm doing. Or even like, I wish you were saying like, that'd be nice for you to be able to take that time off. Yeah. Um, and yet why aren't, why aren't we giving, why didn't I, why aren't you giving permission yourself permission to do that? Yeah. Good. Uh, I'm going to take a walk here this afternoon. It's a, it's a nice day in, in the Denver area. But um, one more question I want to ask before uh, I have to, you have to charge me for counseling here. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, sorry if I'm, <laughs> this is my role. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, talk about, I'm curious, like, you know, I had this thought about, I, I've studied family systems uh, theory a lot and become real appreciative for that kind of model of thinking. And I think about how so often change comes by changing yourself. Um, but also there can be times where systems really are toxic. Uh, and I'm curious, what advice might you have for, for a pastor, for a church leader, for, for a chaplain, for a social worker who is struggling when they're on the fence between like, do I just need to change myself or is this really a toxic system that I just need to get out of? Yeah, it's a really good question, um, and I wish I had a, a really clear cut <laughs> answer. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it's it's situational and yeah. it's about discernment, and um, part of that is involving people in your life. Um, I would say who know you and who are walking with you and who can speak into your life. And all too often, especially in American Christianity, we're so um, isolated, and even the pride of thinking that we can't ask for help and we can't ask yeah. others for discernment. Um, and so do we have people who are speaking into our lives? Do we have people who we can go to who don't have say on, on our, in our role, you know, not a board, not a Mm -hmm. supervisor. Those are important too. Those are highly important. Um, and yet do we have other people? Do we have mentors? Do we have a close community of people who we can say, Hey, I'm struggling or what do you see? And really welcome people's voices. You know, I think for some reason, especially again, American Christianity and our individualistic way mm-hmm. is that we think that we need to do it ourselves. We can't acknowledge to others that we're weak. Um, and that asking people to speak into our lives is humbling. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and say, hey, what do you see? What, or can I process this with you? You know, I have a couple of friends who, mm-hmm. um, I really appreciate it. They invite us into discernment. Like they've been practicing that and, um, even about things that are complete, like I, it doesn't have any connection with me. Mm-hmm. Um, but they say, Hey, can you listen to us and process this? And so they, they in, invite us to do that with them too. And, um, and that's such a gift and it's, it's a gift to listen to them. And then it's a gift to speak into what we hear them saying and just help them hear for themselves. Yeah. Um, and so I think that would be my, uh, not black, not binary answer is that, um, ask for help and ask for discernment from others. Um, maybe take some time off mm-hmm. and if you can to discern if that's a, if it's a good fit or not. 
um, you know, I've worked in a variety of social services and ministries, and um, I tell a story in one of them that I, you know, I had to, I was working um, in a setting that was very uh, challenging mm-hmm. for me, and fe- the job actually felt like it was against my values. Mm. Um, I was working <laughs> in... I didn't, I didn't know what I had taken on when I committed to the job yeah. and it was, um, it was actually a home for kids who had been, um, who are undocumented, who had, um, mm-hmm. unaccompanied minors is the term. Sure. Yeah. Kids yeah, yeah. who had come up. Yeah. And, um, I thought, oh, I, I care about kids and I care about, um, unaccompanied minors and I get to support and care for them. And I was a program manager. I didn't realize that it was actually a DOC, um, kind of overseeing, house and that the kids were, you know, under, um, or not DOC, but Homeland Security. They were under oh, immigration, yeah. wow. DOJ, yeah. Department of Justice. Um, and, um, and so when a kid turned 18, I had to call Homeland Security and, wow. um, I had to walk, come have them walk with the, you know, they came in, they put this kid who was in total shackles and wow. his ankles and his wrists and, um, and here I could saw this kid as a refugee, you yeah. know, as a kid who, who was terrified to go back to his home country, desperate for resources. And my heart broke. And I said, Hey, he's not going to run. You know, he's a good kid. He's mm-hmm. not like, he's a lot. I would just not, not just that he's a good kid, but he's just, he, he's not going to run. And anyway, it was a heartbreaking yeah. experience. And that role just was not a good fit. So that's, um, so sometimes roles are not good fits. Sometimes organizational cultures uh, are not good fits. And, are, yeah. and we might try to change them from within. And if it gets to a place where you can't change them, then sometimes you need to leave. Well, I can I, I can hear that secondary trauma just as you tell that story. <laughs> Incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing yeah. that, by the way. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, this will probably come out, I think, in early spring. I'm going to ask you to kind of foretell a little bit, but talk, talk into pastors, church leaders, kind of as we've been talking about, you know, perhaps the vaccine is rolling out in their community. Perhaps it's still not. What, what advice do you have for them as they're listening to this? Yeah. I mean, I've been talking about doing our own inner work, um, creating time to connect with God and just to not undervalue, underestimate the importance of that, that maybe when this is rolling out, the vaccine is out and there's all this pressure to like regroup and, um, or just whatever pressure there is to, again, those voices of, of that community, those mm-hmm. voices of discernment. Are you asking for help? Are you, do you have people in your life who you're speaking into your life? Um, and are you receiving care? So I, you know, for me, I thought, oh, I should, I, it's so much easier to be the care provider than to receive care. And yeah. so part of my post burnout was going to counseling and getting a spiritual director. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's been super helpful to have a space where I get to share. And to be honest, it still feels awkward for me, <laughs> um, it, to say, okay, this person's going to listen to me when I'm the one who's, I'm used to listening to somebody sure, else. Yeah. Um, that they want to hear whatever is going on for me. And so I think, but I think there's a, a huge um, benefit and necessity almost for pastors, for care providers to have a place where they can receive. Yeah. Um, and so whatever busyness is happening when people are, uh, are listening, that if you have a place to receive that you will, you will be more present and better equipped and more grounded when you are then also listening to others. Um, otherwise, our our lenses, our ability to receive what others are bringing towards us is colored and um, affected by what we're carrying inside of us. I mean, yeah. It is regardless, yeah. but at least we would have more self-awareness. <laughs> yeah. Well, really good. Really good stuff here. Um, let's take a break and we'll come back with some closing questions. Is the church really dying or is it dying to change? How can the church recapture what it was in the first century, a distinctive confessional community willing to stand against the status quo, to speak up against the empire, and to stand for the gospel? How can it do this in a 21st century context? 
This year, the Festival of Homiletics invites you into a conversation around how the promise of the gospel might shape hope and ministry for the future of the church. What is the role of preaching in forming the church of the future? Be inspired by God's word proclaimed by some of the nation's finest ministers and teachers. Experience the fellowship of hundreds of preachers. Learn and worship in an atmosphere that is dynamic, friendly, nurturing, and prophetic. Come renew, refresh, and recharge your spirit. Join the Festival of Homiletics this spring for the 29th Annual Preaching Conference. It will be broadcast virtually the week of May 17th to the 21st, 2021, and is free to all who register. Enjoy over 30 sessions from some of the best practitioners in the business. Michael Curry, Kate Baller, Diana Butler-Bass, Otis Moss II, Brian McLaren, Marilyn Robinson, Adam Russell Taylor, and so many more. Register for free today at festivalofhomiletics.com. All right, we're back with Bethany Dearborn Heiser. And uh, Bethany, I always tell folks you can take these closing questions as seriously or not as you'd like to. Uh, but if you're a Pope for a day, uh, what does that day look like? What do you want to do? Something like that. Yeah, I mean, I just actually was reading that the uh, Pope Francis starts his day with two hours of prayer. Wow. Wow. Um, so, you know, there's, we've been talking about this, mm-hmm. rhythms of rest and of prayer, and there's an example right there um, of someone who knows that they need to spend time with God um, before they face the day. And so I would try to do that if I had the space for that. Um, and, yeah, I also love how Pope Francis loves those who he interacts with, uh-huh. um, the doorkeeper and the um, the people outside, the people on the street, the, you know, just... I, so there's a lot that of the current Pope situation that I really admire and yeah. respect. Um, I think if I had, if I were Pope for the day and I could make some pretty big decisions, yeah. I would, um, you know, I'd want to actually really cut the military budget oh. and direct um, that money towards early childhood intervention, development, and education. Um, we know so much about including pregnancy and yeah. um, parenting. We know so much about early childhood trauma and how it affects us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we would be a changed society if we redirected some of that money um, to the well-being of people, including um, from a young age, from pregnancy through development. There's a program that my friend works for where they follow um pregnant first time moms, mm-hmm. um, from pregnancy all the way till their kids are two. And, um, and I think that the ramifications of that, those early attachment and I mean, um, the connection that the ram- we know we have research, we know that that affects, um, mental health later yeah. on, as well as, you know, we could talk about economy, we could talk about, um, finances, we would, our, our country would save money, mm-hmm. um, if we didn't have people who, or if we had people who were then also able to work and to, um, their mental health was healthier, Mm -hmm. um, because of that. And, and then also to direct some of that money towards mental health resources for adults that, um, I just, it, it, to be honest, it grieves me the the lack of resources that are available for the well being of people in this country. Um, while we are also defending it from the outside and not tending to those who are inside bethany um, we need to do another podcast just on that topic <laughs> holy cow so that's a that's a little side but it does connect in terms of yeah um, no, I, I'm our a, mental well-being 100 percent of trauma. support <laughs> uh, i think about i have two kids and i you know i'm i'm a father so i didn't do any of the physical childbearing thing but you know i got i, I was a week uh i had a week off both kids and i'm like i want to have another kid just so i could have like a paternal break or whatever it's called, but it, it breaks my heart to think about like there are, there are moms out there who have what they have a kid and a week or two later, they have to go back to, to work. And like, how, how in the world do we think this is okay? Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. And I mean, I think just even pre- if I can add in yeah. too, the, I mean, the, so pregnancy support and then post, um, partum support as well as they yeah, have maternity leave and paternity leave. Um, and then following through with, you know, the educate, we also know that the value of 
girls' education globally, mm -hmm. that when girls are educated, you just said you have a couple of kids, and we yep. know that when girls are educated um, and women are supported, that actually it benefits the whole community in a way um, that just focusing on male education doesn't. Yeah. Um, and and actually women tend to bring that money and support back into the community in a different way. Yeah. So and while we're at it, you know, I if we're still, keep going, still keep pope, going. I would, I would, you know, make women priests too. Yeah. <laughs> That's a busy day, so you're gonna you're yeah. gonna need those two hours of prayer. It's true. Who was it's it? True. Who was the famous theologian or somebody who said like, "There's some quote I'm thinking of who says like, this day is gonna be so full that I need to commit this much time in prayer." Some hmm. quote I can't remember. Hmm. Uh, anyway, sp but speaking of yeah. that, a theologian or historical Christian figure you would want to meet or bring back to life. Yeah, I mean that's a hard one. There's I feel like there would be a lot of people. Um, this might be somewhat cliche as a helping pro professional ministry worker person, but, um, you know, I've always read and appreciated Mother Teresa. Sure. Um, his work as well as obviously her work in Calcutta. Um, I spent a short time in Calcutta. Um, oh, wow. And, um, and I think I'm also drawn to her because of her own wrestling and her kind of yeah. dark night of the soul yeah. and connection with God. And I, I haven't read that book because I know she didn't want it published yeah, her yeah. own journal. Um, so I've wrestled with that, but I, I, I know enough of just what it's about that there's, there's a heartache and there's a, um, yeah, just curious. I would love to talk to her. <laughs> I remember, I remember, I think it was like 2006, 2007 that kind of came out. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a time article on it. I remember I was sitting in my doctor's office getting ready to talk to him about my mental health and mm -hmm. reading that, article from mother mm -hmm. about mother trace and it's just like mm -hmm. wow mm -hmm. uh, anyway we're running out of time here yeah talk about burnout maybe. yeah yeah <laughs> right. yeah what do you think history will remember from this current time and place i mean i think some of what we've already talked about and especially in terms of america if we're talking about american christianity yeah. um that we're busy we're individually focused um and i yeah um, and the, the movement of success and up the, you know, the emphasis on moving up the ladder yeah. um, instead of um, bringing people from the margins all together, that we are all connected as a, as a web of life. Yeah. Some people talk about it. So, uh, what, do you, what do you hope for for the future of Christianity? Yeah, that we might be known as loving, peaceful, uh, reconciling people that, um, I don't know if you know, Oh, Heidi Baker says that we are laid down lovers so that we are connected to God and we know that we are loved by God and loving others. Mm, um, th Heidi Baker? Yeah. Check her out. Um, yeah, she's a missionary in um, Mozambique. Um, and then I also um, love that I just read recently, R Richard Vohr says, only whole people can imagine and call forth a whole world. Mm. Um, so I would hope that Christians, those who follow triune God, um, that they would seek their to be whole mm. <laughs> and seek healing, to be yeah. healers in our own healing. Um, and part of that being pract or pra practicing being still and knowing that God is God and being rooted as beloved ones. Um, and that out of that place that we also know that all are loved by God um, and kind of move beyond those binary uh, distinctions entering into that mystery of God's love. You know, this is the week before Christmas. And yeah. love God's, the mystery of God's incarnation, that the kingdom is is here and not yet. And so how do we be yeah. okay with that uncertainty and be pursuers, seekers of the kingdom, not just um, uh, pretending like it's all up to us too. That's a great, that's a great Advent message right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, where can people find out more about you and your book? Yeah, I have a website, which is my name, bethanydearbornheiser.com, and it has information about my book as well as I lead workshops. I'm actually leading a, well, it'll be over by the time this comes out, but just a, a retreat, a mini retreat that invites people to practice some of what we're talking about, examine and stillness and some reflection. So I might be offering more of those in this coming year. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Well, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I hope it, uh, I know it's been meaningful to me. I hope it's been meaningful to our listeners. Uh, so uh, thank you. Merry Christmas uh, for you, you and for our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> hope you had a Merry Christmas and uh, may, may God's peace be with you. Thank you. Appreciate it with you as well. 
Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. But hey, before you go, do us a favor, subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people. Thanks and go in peace.